Amy Fiedler, Certified Trauma Support Specialist and the Certified Holistic Life Coach. That's my guest on this episode, and I couldn't have been more thrilled to talk to Amy, and you're going to be thrilled to hear all the wonderful things she has to say, and all the wonderful things I have to say, of course. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about the new exciting changes made and available now on patreon.com slash Craig and Friends, because the tiers are different, the prices are different, and the options for delight just keep growing. So now, you can go over there and for a dollar you can be a pal. What's a pal? A pal gets advanced, uncut, commercial-free editions of all of these episodes, about two weeks in advance. Now this week, uh, the new advanced episode will be up later in the week, but you don't know when you're listening to this, because I don't know when you're listening to this. So, why even dwell on the day? And being a pal? It's terrific. But being a friend? It's even better. And for the $3 a month option, that's exactly what you'll be. And with that, you get two bonus episodes a month featuring my thoughts on life, love, mental health, uh, being a new parent, all kinds of things, uh, movie and music recommendations. The list goes on. And for $5 a month, well, you can be a friend with benefits. And those benefits include all of the previously mentioned gems, plus chats with myself and Ada, intimate exclusive chats where we talk about being polyqueer, neurodiverse lovers uh, who are also parents, and all the hijinks that ensue in all aspects of our life. And if you're a friend with benefits, you also get to ask listener questions. Yes, those are coming roaring back to the Patreon, and you can ask us anything. We're not terribly shy, as you may have guessed already. And you get to add your comments and questions to the movie clubs, because the movie clubs are now a feature of the regular Craig and Friends feed. But you can be part of the process before they hit tape. You also get access to the films in a secret kind of way. Who knows how they get to us that way, but enough about that. You can find out on the page. And then we move along to the $10 tier, which gets you all of the previously mentioned benefits, plus a monthly Zoom hangout with the gang and us, of course. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to patreon.com slash Craig and friends and make your day a better one. In other news going forward, all of these episodes will be visually enabled on YouTube and Spotify. Yes, full video episodes. The podcast is going completely video. So you can listen to audio, you can listen to video, or you can watch audio. Whichever you want to do, you can do it now on YouTube or Spotify. Now, let's get into my chat with the fabulous Amy Fiedler. How you doing? I'm good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for doing the, the show. Of course, you have such a distinct, like, almost like radio voice. It's Thank impressive. You. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, and your, your delivery is wonderful as well, because you're giving a lot of uh, very sort of difficult topics and difficult lessons, but in a very um, easy to consume way. It's very soothing and um, very uh, clearly aware of the audience. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, You're it's, it's deep, but I try to simplify, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you do a wonderful job at it. And I, uh, yeah, I caught your Instagram stuff for a while. And these are topics that are really interesting uh, to me. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and in terms of radio, yeah, I'm looking into some voiceover stuff too. <laughs> I mean, I can hear it, you know? Like, it's, yeah, you've got that voice. Ensure oh. it. You know what I mean? Like a hand exactly. model, but yeah. your vocal cords. Yeah, exactly. Whatever Roger Daltrey had, I'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, welcome, Amy Fiedler. Thank you. Thank, oh, thank you. You said it right. Everybody gets it wrong. It, maybe it's because the Boston Pops had Arthur Fiedler as the conductor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm often asked if I'm related, and I'm not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had a feeling, uh, ba- based on some of the stories that you told, I was like, that doesn't sound like Arthur Fiedler kind of business. <laughs> <laughs> So how would you best describe to folks new to your work, uh, your general description of what you do? Um, I, I would say that I support individuals who are, you know, moving through trauma and coming into more healthy, supportive relationships after having experienced possibly toxic or abusive relationships or a childhood and upbringing of such. So, you know, navigating the triggers and trying to figure out how to communicate in the appropriate ways to deliver their messages without being reactive or defensive and really growing an intimate connection with each other is key, whether that's friendship, family, or romance. 
Hmm. And I notice a lot of your materials focus on how important it is that we start with ourselves and having to sit down with ourselves. When your podcast as well, and the name of that is? <laughs> the name of my podcast is Connect the Dots, Bitch. And yes. <laughs> everybody gets it mixed up. They're like, that's so offensive. And I'm like, I'm talking to myself. I'm calling myself a bitch. And I'm talking about my experiences and really connecting the dots in my own life while conveying you know, little snippets and gems for them to take away and implement into their life. And I have to compliment you also on being uh, so fluid in the solo performance of the podcast <laughs> as well. It's not the easiest thing to do to just sit and talk for an hour with no, no one to bounce off of. I, pre I appreciate that coming from you, honestly. No, that I is a you. genuine, genuine compliment and also probably a little bit of my childhood trauma. I'm a middle child and, you know, I like attention, but I never felt heard. So it's just easiest to like speak to myself all day and entertain myself. That's a really good tip, though. Don't you think? I think even for, for people who don't have uh, a public facing operation to talk yeah. to yourself. Do you think that that's a, a valid thing to do? I think it's a valid thing to do. And I think it's incredibly helpful in really understanding yourself, you know, mm -hmm. like some people keep everything in their head and I'm a, a strong proponent of getting it out of your head and on paper, or even just like I tell clients sometimes text message yourself because there's something that happens psychologically when you send it and then you receive it back, you know, at yeah. you, yeah. it really awakens you to some things. So yeah, however you got to do it, talk out loud. Who cares who's listening? I mean, for a period of time, the mask kind of helped walking into the grocery store and like talking to myself. Nobody really could see me or oh, yeah. was muffled, but I do it without a mask too and don't really care. So <laughs> yeah, It's really good. I think a lot of times people get uptight about being out in public and doing things. You even see people getting uptight about behavior. And I mean, I've done it as well because sometimes we think that there's some kind of big brother in a sense watching us, meaning yeah. the other people there, which is also conditioned from other you know, possible social anxiety may be cultivated through, who knows, bullying or who, um, what do you call it, uh, hovering and micromanaging from others in the past or whatever, all those yeah. fun things that can happen to us. <laughs> They're so fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're so fun. And they such a lovely, del uh, delightful cornucopia of them to pick. From. Yeah. You know, I, I think what happens, I, I've thought long and hard about what you just said myself, like in mm. my own life, because I used to have major social anxiety, like going to a grocery store intimidated me because mm -hmm. I felt like the entire store was watching me and right. like, you know, analyzing me. And then I realized that's a really, I mean, for lack of a better way to say this self-centered way to live your life is to like walk around thinking everybody is just tuned into you. But the truth is it does develop from other environments you've frequented. You know, I grew up in a, a strict household in an environment where my parents were pretty controlling at times. So mm -hmm. they blamed me for a lot of things and they really honed in on my facial expressions or my actions. So of course I go out into the world and think everybody's doing the same thing. And that's right. kind of, I mean, what like trauma does in general, it generalizes it. We just like apply it to everybody that we bump into when the real, the real key to like healing something like that, any type of trauma is to pull out the distinctions in your experience. You know, that wasn't, that's not every man in my life. That was my dad. And my dad is this way. So, right. Yeah. And I like how you tie all that together too with relational issues, because you speak a lot about how trauma obviously impacts us, but then we have to be aware of that because we can be reactive, like you mentioned before. And if we're not aware of that, then we can complicate or maybe destroy a situation that isn't the same situation because it might present in a passing way like an old situation. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, you said it so well, when, oh, when you're a survivor of trauma or abuse, you, it lives in your body. And so you could leave the environment, you could leave the relationship and it could be years that it has mm. happened. And one little thing, it could be a noise. It could be a sound, a smell, a word, a facial expression could trigger you. And I always explain it. Like if it's confusingly similar then you immediately generalize and act as if you're back in that environment that you were traumatized in. And 
you could, and being somebody who is a trauma survivor, I can speak on this. Sure. You, you can look at the person in front of you or the environment and be like, I know this is different, but it feels real in your body. And that's, what's so complicated about life after trauma is because it's really, you know, this integrative process of, of being able to understand what's going on outside of you and start to, I don't know, untangle what's going on inside you and really align it together because it's really misaligned after trauma. It, yeah, it really is. And I am a, a trauma survivor as well. Um, so many of us are, right? But in, in yeah. relational sense too. And it's really difficult, I find, or I have found, when there's something that presents, in, especially in a high stress situation, if you have a, um, say, a week that's high stress for whatever reason, then there's something that comes up. And then I think of it like spinning plates. You're like, oh, okay, there's this thing. Now, do I react to it in this way or that way? And then you can be frozen. Uh, yeah. with, so frozen and fawn are unfortunately two of the things that I have done before. And then I think, well, I don't want to do those. Right. So yeah. then I don't want to do those. But what do I want to do? Oh, I don't want to be too aggressive because I've been too, you know, it, it, you just think about like, you know, when you've lost your temper on someone or whatever. So and then I always think of it like the spinning plates. You're like, oh, there up goes another one, up goes another one. And then <laughs> the energy is drained. And then, you know, but then you have to, I, you know, if you just talk about it with the person, which is can be tricky and all that, then that usually uh, dissolves it. I mean, I agree a thousand percent. I'm a big talker. So, you know, Same. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have the words for it. Not yeah. a lot of people can get them out of their mouth or find a way to articulate it, but that's kind of why the start of this process, when you know, you've been through something traumatic is really get to know you and what is really activating those reactions in you. What is, what is stirring that up and what's the trajectory of that, right? Like, how does that impact your day mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually? Do you take it out on other people? Do you freeze? You know, I have a freeze response a lot of the time too. And, and what we fail to realize in these moments is our executive functioning shuts down. So we try to yeah. think our way out of it and we just fucking can't. Like, that's not <laughs> how our body functions at all. Right. And then everything else is very difficult to concentrate on because yes. these cycles or the plates or whatever that occupying all of our mental energy field. Oh, it consumes you. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and so it's just like a wasted day. And so what I'll often tell people is like, if you know that, right, if you know this triggers this and then this is my reaction or my response to it, that's where we have to go back and go, OK, let's find a coping mechanism to deal to deal with that to rectify it, to prevent the trajectory from occurring, right? right? To reroute it in a different direction. And, you know, that's a difficult process because it takes a lot of mindfulness to want to even like slow down. And that's what a lot of trauma and abuse survivors have to do is slow down their lives, slow down their decisions and live more intentionally because their body doesn't allow otherwise. Right. And then there's a, the other component, too, where it's like, well, wait a sec, uh, won't get fooled again. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I got to be careful. I know. And so and that thing where that can, um, again, I guess, I guess it's reactive, but also it can build into this own separate personality almost, which is not oh, yeah. yours. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's like it's this other voice that's just inside your head, but it's your voice and it sounds very real. And you're like, I've had experiences like mine was always don't get too happy. When you get too happy, all the bad shit happens, right? That other shoe drops. And so right. I'd watch myself like work hard, get to a place, sabotage right before I get the thing I want, right? Yeah. Or as I'm receiving it, because it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I need to remain in control. And if I create the problem or the other shoe dropping, then it's not happening to me from an outside source that I can't control. I think that happens a lot with people who um, maybe even don't think about it as much in those terms, but they think about like, why do I have such bad luck? You hear those kind of yeah. tropes. And I, I often think, well, I think that might be because you're bringing it about yourself. I mean, we're all prone to it and it's not pointing yeah. a finger at anyone, but I think no. that there is a certain um, danger in not even looking at one's own responsibility in the whole process because then you're sort of doomed to failure. I mean, it's difficult enough when you do recognize your own part in it. And you're like, well, oh, I have to figure out this, 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 and this. But uh, without that, I think you're a bit adrift. 
I mean, that's exactly why, Craig, they, that people don't take accountability is because the workload that they fear is going to come with that is like yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. You know, I used to have these conversations regarding my mom because we were always like butting heads my entire life. And I would say to the people that I was like going to for support, I don't get it. Like, why doesn't she just own her shit? And they're like, do you understand she's been doing this for like 60 years? Like she hasn't addressed <laughs> anything for 60 years. Could you imagine that many decades of stuff compiled in you? Yeah. Like, it's just easier to keep going the way you're going and not address it and just hope people stick around and tolerate it. Right. And a really interesting point you made on the episode. I can't remember the number of it, but the name of the episode has uh, identifying with the pain, I think, in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really a great way that you put it. And I recommend everyone check it out because that's a common trap that we can do because yeah. uh, to process something, you have to sit and think about it or like sort of feel the feelings, which is another thing sometimes is not the most uh, attractive proposition. But then we can also have uh, fall prey to the uh, pothole of making that our character mm, that's a good way to say that though oh, i mean you <laughs> i appreciate you, that i quite i quite i quite like the way you put everything so that's well nice. <laughs> thank you i mean i'm honored and flattered as oh, well, well so it's just like a mutual <laughs> appreciation we got going here i'm even more honored you listen to my podcast like oh, wow. sometimes i'm like i just sit here and like face the wall and talk to myself all day. And then when someone like says they listened, I'm like, I know people are listening. I see the numbers. But when you say it to me, I'm like, holy shit, you listen to that. Like, <laughs> when I bumped into someone outside after the pandemic, uh, the main yeah. body of the heart of the pandemic, and they said they referenced something in the show and they were like, oh, I really like it. I was like, oh my, thank God. Like it's just <laughs> in, in an in-person thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's crazy. No, but uh, identifying with the pain is like, I mean, I feel like it's something that a lot of people get trapped in because mm. they don't even realize they're doing it. But I, I, I actually posted recently on this topic on my Instagram and I said, you know, one of the key things to pay attention to so you can become aware about about identifying with it is are you retelling the story and using it as an excuse for yeah. why you're behaving or reacting or responding. And listen, I've done it. I mean, I'll own my shit all day. I've done it millions of times and not on purpose. It's just like, yeah, well, you don't understand. I've been through X, Y, and Z. Yeah. At a certain point, you've got to pivot and go, and here's how I'm going to move forward, right? Here's how I want yeah. to be behaving. And these are the tools that I can utilize to calm myself down and regulate my nervous system. And to that end, uh, is there a good amount of time that you think you should say, okay, I've sort of been dwelling on this or this has been fixed on my mind, say like a, some kind of falling out with a friend or issue with a family member or loved one. And then is there a shelf life date that you think in rough terms that could be applied to something like that in terms of having it come up in every conversation? Because I often wonder about that. And again, I've uh, fallen prey to the temptations of these things, just as you have, as we all have. Yeah. Um, and I try to be mindful of that. Um, but sometimes, you know, you're a little uh, upset by something or you're carried away with that, but then it can become the ever repeating loop in the mind, which yeah. is not good because then you're thinking about this negative experience or this reason, like you said, with your mom, something that, you know, the, the math is going to always result in the same equation. So yeah. to get frustrated about it. And you pointed out that your partner, Phil, uh, yeah. has uh, helped you approach this sort of subject in a different way. Yeah. Well, listen, my, my boyfriend has a master's in counseling, but you know, he works in entertainment. So it's not, <laughs> it's not like he's counseling people all day. I just happened to luck out that I ended up with a man who like <laughs> has knowledge of this. And therefore, like, here I am with all of my shit. And he's like, oh, like, I don't have that shit. Like, I had a healthier upbringing <laughs> than you do. And now gets to, like, utilize his master's degree in the relationship, right? Um, so <laughs> That's I'm good. Some people, some people end up with a chef. Some people end up, you know, this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it works. You usually balance each other out. But he, you know, what's really great is, like, his approach to like specifically with my mom, like he's really great with my mom. And at first I was like, 
you're just like really great because you don't get her and you don't know how she operates yet. You haven't seen and, the whole movie yet. So don't yeah, tell no. me. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> so, so then he would, you know, I'd clue him in to like, no, 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 no. Like I know the text message sounds nice, Phil, but what you don't understand is like, this is a manipulative tactic that she's always used to feel included, to get information, to be in control, whatever. And so then he started to pay attention. He was like, aha, I get it. Okay. And because I was able to, and I think this answers your question in and of itself, right? Because I was able to point out that I am aware that this is her pattern. Mm -hmm. It's like, shut the fuck up about it now, Amy. Like, you know better. You're not blind to it. This is not just triggering you and irritating you and frustrating you and you don't have an understanding of where it's coming from. So I think like that's the takeaway here. If you have an understanding of what is happening, whatever mm -hmm. it is, right, with that individual or with yourself, here's what's playing out for me. If you're able to be mindful of that and articulate it to somebody or to yourself out loud, then stop telling the story. Sure. Now it's now find a solution. Yeah. So I would get trapped in the I'm so aware and here's what's happening. <laughs> and he was like, Shh, okay, stop. <laughs> like yeah. do something different because you're just retelling the same story over and over and reliving this. Right. And reliving it is the key, which is what we don't want to do. And we don't realize a lot of the times that that's what we're doing. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I, I kept going, well, it's not your mom. Like you don't understand. You can grow up with this. It's not your mom. And he was like, he, we have this signal with each other where he goes like this, uh -huh. which just means like, Amy, you're going in circles at this point and it makes sense to you, but nobody outside of you. And for me, that indicates, oh, maybe like go grab your journal and like process <laughs> this out. And then once it makes sense to like an outsider, go have a conversation with them about it. Yeah. Again, back to the text message to yourself or email or a note. I mean, I've done that in the last couple of years. I mean, around Christmas, there was like a fraught time where someone might, there was a family member who came over. They might've been infected. We didn't know. It was right before a flight. It was like that compounding something else, compounding something else. Also, first trip after not going anywhere at all for yeah. a year and a half. So there was just a lot of uh, banana land feelings is what I like to call it. It's like a one-way ticket to banana land is what uh, Ada <laughs> and I refer to it as. And uh, this note was very, very thorough. It was like the liner notes to a box set. But it was out of my system, and I got on the plane. And I didn't call anyone, and was like, "You, you know," and none of that. So that was yeah. very helpful. Yeah, you know why? Because emotions just need an outlet. They just need to yeah. be seen, heard, and validated. So whatever you want that outlet to be is just. A lot of people seem to think it's easier to shout at other people, but truly not really productive because often you're not going to get the validation you're wanting. But if you just put it on paper and you're like. Oh, this is how I feel and it's okay that I feel that way then you move right through it right yeah I think acknowledging uh that it's okay to feel that way or also I always think too of uh, certain emotions that are essentially childlike and extremely vulnerable uh, a lot of people do not want to get into that I mean I've been guarded against that as well but I find sometimes you just ask in the most simple way whether it's an insecurity or whatever it is that yeah. that's helpful as well yeah. Incredibly helpful. Incredibly mm. helpful. And honestly, though, it takes a level of maturity to acknowledge you've got immature <laughs> emotions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know? like, it's truly the immature that can't acknowledge I'm being immature right now. It's those that have outgrown that who can stand back and go, oh, I'm kind of being a little bitch, aren't I? You know? <laughs> well, and really, we don't ever uh, get rid of our inner child, do we? No, no, no. But we do like, have to return to it because I feel like the majority of us lose touch with it mm -hmm. as we grow up because we think we have to. Like, right. Oh, we can't have fun. We can't be playful. We can't be silly because people blanket the word immature on a lot of those expressions. But I mean, in the sense of immaturity, like if we define that properly, immaturity is I, I act out of an egotistical place, right? I act out of an insecure place. I act out of a mindless place. Right. But being playful and returning to your inner child is a very healing process that not enough of us, I mean, I, me, I literally have alarms on my phone 
have fun, Amy, you know, like <laughs> to, to, I, ha- I have to have like forced fun and forced relaxation. Yeah. Otherwise I won't allow it for myself. I've noticed uh, a little bit recently that I was sort of essentially starving myself of the things that I love to consume. Mm. Like films reset me, they reset my nervous system and music as well. Uh, yeah. Particularly if I'm in deep in an anxiety hole, if I put on mm. like even a mediocre movie, sometimes those are the best. Uh, one I don't know, like a romantic comedy from the 80s, Legal Eagles, I've mentioned on the show before, uh, kind of a tepid Robert Redford, Daryl Hannah, Deborah Winger movie. And yeah. it's, a, it's uh, yeah, and it's got some, it's very 80s, is, that helps as well. But if I get pulled into something for 20 minutes, then I'm like, oh, I've forgotten what was spinning yeah. around in my head on a loop, and now I can resume operation. And I think that speaks to the inner child thing as well, because that was a very strong source of soothing and happiness as a kid in kind of a turbulent uh, school life and all of that. Yeah. We, I mean, good point, though, because oh. like when you no, it is a good point, because I'll I'll rewatch certain shows. And I think this is probably resonates across the board with tons of people. Yeah. When I'm in a dark place, when I'm in a very anxious place, when I'm in a very sad place. I need familiarity and I need comfort and I need stability. And those were not easily accessible outside of me for a large portion of my life. So I had certain TV shows, right? And so I'll rewatch. I'm just like outing myself here. I'll rewatch like Beverly Hills 90210. Like, By the way, this is a great show to out yourself on. I did it to myself. <laughs> and so, yeah. <laughs> I, it never gets old. And I will just like, <laughs> watch the entire thing and then I'll start again and I'll watch and like people do this though they have like a show before bed every night that they rewatch out of comfort like mm-hmm. mine was always like friends I'd put friends on right before bed and it was something that I I knew the characters and I felt at home and I felt safe and we do that I love 80s movies I mean like you know, the ones that I grew up on, it brings back this nostalgia at a good point in my life. So Mm. when I watch something like that, again, I go to a really calm, centered, balanced place. What are some other of your favorite um, go-to repeatables from the 80s? (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, I mean, listen, I'm not the best with names, but truly any of the movies with like the Brat Pack in them, oh, yeah. for some reason, I like live for. And <laughs> even Blue yeah. City, did you ever see Blue City with Judd Nelson yeah. and Ali Sheedy? It is no. rotten. And I, I I would love to send it to you if I can find a copy. If not here, when I go back to LA, I will. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, <laughs> then I'm going to watch the next time I talk to you. I'll be like, listen, that's now my go-to film. <laughs> that's fantastic. Listen, I do movie clubs too we should do we should find a brat pack movie because i'm oh. sure we'll litter the conversation with references to other brat pack films and then when they yeah. went off the boil a little bit like fresh horses with andrew mccarthy and molly <laughs> Re- stinker but ben stiller's in it and it's real bad so it's uh, <laughs> but anyway so yeah the brat pack stuff like saint elmo's fire i imagine yes 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 but also like and this totally contradicts that genre like then I will also go to like the mob movies, like Goodfellas and <laughs> yes. Casino, like yeah. on repeat twenty four seven. So it's it's interesting. Like I don't I don't know how it all kind of works together, but it's <laughs> rather comforting for me. Yeah, same here. I love uh, particularly extreme Italian horror films and Italian <laughs> police dramas because they're crazy, and yeah. and also the the any crime film, uh, basically yeah. any crime film, and if something's particularly sleazy from the early eighties. Uh, yeah. There's a gem called Fear City that Abel Ferrara did with Melanie Griffith playing a, stri- a heroin addicted stripper. Forgive me, I want to just stripper. That's not enough. Okay. And okay. Uh, there's a murderer around town. It's it fails the Bechdel test probably, but it's good. Uh, but uh, <laughs> on the cheerier side of things, uh, Goodfellas, etc. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we we mentioned a little bit about your uh, background. Would you like to give a sort of a thumbnail sketch of growing up? You talk about it a lot on your podcast, but for maybe folks getting to know you through this episode. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm middle of three children and, um, you know, growing up my parents, and I always say this and you hear me say it on the podcast a lot. Like I love my parents. My parents are good people. I didn't agree and didn't like how my parents parented, you know, and I recognize now having moved through a lot of this 
they truly were doing the best they could with the way they were raised. But to put it very bluntly, they were very strict, very controlling. I mean, verbally abusive. There was threats. There was physical stuff happening. And just a lot of gaslighting, yelling, screaming, things like that. It was a pretty chaotic, toxic stress environment growing up. And what's interesting, and, and I feel like this is important to add, you know, I'm, I'm watching now, my, I have a nephew. He's, I mean, I talk about him a lot. He's one. And so since my brother has become a, a father, I'm watching him start to move through a lot of the parent stuff. Yeah. Whereas like, I'm obviously now like kind of like removed from it, have worked on it for the past several years. And, and that's, I think, important to recognize when you have siblings, you can all grow up in the same house and really feel differently about mm. your experiences. Right. And everybody kind of always looked at me like, what the hell is wrong with her? Like, why, <laughs> why <laughs> is she so crazy? And why is she talking about all of this negative stuff? But the irony is I've been able to have open conversations with my parents mm. because I'm a pretty outspoken person and I am brutally honest. Like I would much rather just tell you straightforward how I feel about something than really kind of drop hints and make you guess. And when I was, I, I've written two books and, and when the first book was coming out, I remember saying to my parents, like, listen, <laughs> I <laughs> said some things and I tried to be respectful of you guys and your life and your reputation and your images and all of that, because I think that's really important and respectful to do, but this is speaking from my experience and these are my feelings. So yeah, a lot of childhood trauma, a lot of stuff that then led me down the path of ending up in very abusive romantic relationships with, um, and I, I feel like this is important to say, uh, my father was strict and very intimidating mm -hmm. and in charge and in control. Although my mom was kind of like the breadwinner, like my mm -hmm. mom controlled the money and really like leveraged that in her favor to control you and your love for her and all of that. Sure. I ended up with men, like I have daddy issues and mommy issues. So I ended up with men who are really wealthy, who controlled me and I allowed them to control me and used money. So it was like a nice hot mess, like between <laughs> the two parents of like yeah. where I landed. Yeah. And, you know, a path that way, kind of, I mean, in the midst of that, struggling with my own mental health, going to regular types of conventional therapy, getting medicated, getting labeled, doesn't work for me personally, mm -hmm. works for many people. And I try to be honest about that, but I didn't learn what I was struggling with and why I was struggling with it. And I didn't learn how to deal with it. I just was told like, here, take these pills. You have severe anxiety, take these pills. You have depression. Mm -hmm. So I got curious and I kind of took a spiritual route in the midst of all of this abuse and shit that was, you know, re-traumatizing me in the process and figured some stuff out about myself and realized well, shit, I don't want to work in fashion anymore. <laughs> I want to help people. Cause... Fashion, the most supportive industry you can find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that tells you a lot about where I was at. You know? Well, at least you're having fun at work. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, gave me a lot of good material to, to work on. I can of. imagine. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, I mean, I got self curious and then ended up kind of like rerouting my life and, and actively worked through my stuff while actively kind of educating and getting qualified and certified to do this. And here I am, you know, years later, I'm like nine years deep into this as a business. Which is amazing. And how long was it before you entered into it as a business when you were just um, on the other side of it, let's say? Lord. So <laughs> I started, I started going to therapy. I asked my parents, could I actually I asked my mom, can I go to therapy when I was like 15 years old? Wow. And she was like, <laughs> I, cause I said, I wanted to kill myself. And she was like, I didn't raise you to say things like that. And she got angry. And I said, I can't talk to you. <laughs> you just get <laughs> mad at me for <laughs> telling you how I feel. Yeah. I said, can I go to a professional? She said, yes, but don't tell your father. He'll think you're crazy. Oh, and well, uh, that's at least something helpful came out. 
that's yeah 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 i am crazy but like you know <laughs> i own my crazy and i use it for good so it's yeah. good it's a win -win yeah. all the way around <laughs> i um i lost my train of thought actually oh i'm sorry i tend to do that uh oh and then we froze so it's a perfect time to freeze uh now okay. we're back now we're back we sorry okay. I, i'm i'll do that i'll derail to the trains of thought no, it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I do it too. I you see, I talk to myself all day on a podcast and then <laughs> run out of thoughts for everybody else. Did anyone I, ever um, uh, um, diagnose you with ADHD during that period when you were getting diagnosed with things? Or no? no, but you know what? Here's the thing. So in my in my trauma certification, we learned that a lot of people with trauma are misdiagnosed with ADHD. And, you know, and then there's people who have trauma and ADHD. Mm -hmm. And the more, I mean, I'm 37 now. So the more I kind of like unlayer stuff mm -hmm. and really come more into myself and into a more balanced place in all areas of my life, I definitely am self-diagnosing with ADHD mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. Like, be, I, it's and I say, yeah, because I have it. That's uh, not like, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm you spot it. You got it. Kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly. Right there with you. Yeah. I, <laughs> I can't, but you know, I feel like it's worked to my benefit thus far because I'm very efficient. I get shit done fast, but you want me to sit and focus on one task. I mean, we're talking and we can go all over the place. So this is fun. Yeah. But if you were like type something for the next oh. five hours, yeah. I'd be like, no, I can't. I can't. It's like, torture yeah same here uh writing like especially sort of form letter type things is like kryptonite yeah, yeah. well mm. i mean i'm i'm working on creating i kind of technically my first like online course mm. and i i'm like this is hard i can't i can't sit and like do this like type things out and script like just put me on camera and i'll talk and it'll make sense to my people <laughs> <laughs> right. No, exactly. I've had a similar thing when I had to yeah. type something out. I was like, why don't I just do what I sort of do best, which is talk it out. And then if yeah. I have to write it down, maybe just transcribe it or something. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. We kind of work backwards, but it works to our benefit. Yeah, it does. I think ADHD can be a superpower in a lot of ways. Yeah. I'm not that bothered about the things that maybe I'm not as skilled in because of it or whatever. Like for instance, directionally, I'm hopeless, um, but there's GPS, so I don't really need to bother. <laughs> No, no, you don't understand. This is funny because <laughs> Phil and I, this is one thing that we like, we have major conflict about. <laughs> Not these days, like these days it's gotten better. But at the start of our relationship, he was like, you don't know your surroundings very well. And I was like, no, I do. I'm fine. Like, <laughs> if I want to go to the water, it's that way. I'm going to go to my brother's apartment. It's that way. And he's like, no, Amy, like you would get lost in a shoebox. And I was like, no, I have a phone. And he's like, what if you don't have access to a GPS? I'm like, where would that happen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Where? Yeah. So I've become more mindful of like, where am I going and what am I doing without a GPS? Because it's a value to my partner, but mm. I'm still with the mindset of like, it works. I, I've been fine for 37 years. I'll figure it out. You know, <laughs> I found that I sort of had, I think from the years before GPS and cell phones, I kind of had an aversion, a slight antipathy that almost uh, resulted in a mild, uh, what do you call it when you don't want to leave the house? Um, agoraphobia, a mild one. I think that was exacerbated during the pandemic. I mean, a, a whole bunch of fun stuff got exacerbated during the pandemic, but, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I noticed that, um, sometime recently and, but I'm very adventurous and I like to go places and travel by myself and everything. But, uh, anyway, yeah, it's funny because certain things crop up because of that. It, well, it, you brought up conflict with your partner and one of the, one of my favorite, uh, things in your recent reels and probably your work in general is talking about how conflict will arise and it's really a matter of knowing that it will arise and dealing with it in a respectful way for yourself and the other person yeah i think that people mislabel conflict as all as it being bad like all the time and i know that because in my house growing up it was bad all the right. time it yeah. there was no conflict resolution taught or shown to us so for me being in a healthy relationship it was like 
oh my God, you're going to leave me. Like at the sign of like a problem, like it was the end and I was going to be abandoned because that, I mean, mom and dad showed me they can't handle their emotions. And when they're pissed off, I'm going to get the silent treatment. You're going to withhold love. I'm going to have to apologize for things I didn't do. And that puts you in conflict with yourself when you move out of that environment. And you're like, still believing though, that everybody acts that way. Cause you're like, wait, I don't, I don't take responsibility for other people anymore, but I guess I'm going to have to, to keep you here. And like, that creates a problem, but yeah. So conflict is actually productive if you allow it to be, because it allows, and it's an open door to walk through and and really understand people a little bit better, Mm -hmm. hear them a little bit differently, find common ground and solutions. And I'm a very solution oriented thinker. So the minute, and maybe a little bit like got an aversion to conflict still. So when there's conflict, I'm very quick to be like, okay, we don't need to think about <laughs> this anymore. Let's just like move to the sleep. He's like, you need to let me have my emotions. And then we will. He's like, we will always seek a solution together, but you have to allow me my process too. And that's been a learning experience because I've never had anybody in my life romantically claiming space in a healthy way. So I was like, oh, wait, you want space on this? That's bad. That's horrible. That's the other shoe dropping. And he was like, no, 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 no. This is healthy and this is necessary. And you're going to allow me this so I can come back to you with a better mindset and having processed my stuff too. Right. Because everyone does that at a different pace. Yeah. Which is tricky. (laughs) That is tricky. That is true. Well, as somebody who's like a very, like, I'm quick. Mm. So it, and, and mainly again, childhood trauma has shaped me. So it's mainly because if I didn't figure that out very quickly, I was going to have to endure something that I didn't want to endure for much longer. So I was very quick to be like, where's the problem? Find the solution, find the words, fix it. And I've, I became the fixer in the family. Like I'm still the go-to person for my parents. Like, Mm -hmm. have you talked to your sister lately could you make sure she's not angry no call her yourself be like yeah (laughs) right because you have to do that because otherwise uh that's like one of those other plates kind of thing because i've noticed when even it's a perceived uh let's say threat to uh status quo or happiness or peace of mind then you think oh is it that and then you think of those old setups whether it's family or former romantic relationships and uh, or i of you i'm saying you know the, the universal you um will think okay i interchange well, it too, all the time <laughs> good yeah, good good <laughs> <laughs> thank you and it, it you think oh well this is going to have to be the way that i do things i'm going to have to bend over backwards i'm going to have to tiptoe and what then if you really boil it down you go oh wait am i telling myself i'm going to have to walk on eggshells because then that's not good. And then also discerning, is this that or is this not that? And I'm uh, projecting that onto it because of the fear from the trauma and all that. Yeah, that's the hardest part for a lot of people is that right there is the am I projecting it or not? Right? Like, is this something I have to take accountability for because I'm actually like at fault here? Or no, is it really their stuff? And people struggle with that. They really do. Like I, I, I get it because when you're projecting, it feels very real for you. You've yeah. convinced yourself it is not you, it is them. But you know that that's kind of where we have to. And, and the irony here, Greg, is that when, on my on my Instagram, when I give posts on this topic of like what is and is not your responsibility in a relationship, like how to figure that out, which mm-hmm. is like the one thing that I see so many people struggle. Oh, we froze. It'll come back in a second. It's, in, it's interesting when you hand them the solutions, they're like, no, I'm still committed to, you know, my excuses and don't want to take accountability. Yeah. It actually froze for a second in the middle and right in the middle wow. of that. But that's um, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, but you do cover a lot of that in your posts, and that. Uh, but it's great to re- return to that uh, over and over because we do have to return to that over and over. It never yeah. quite goes away, right? No, it's a forever thing, and it's very simple. Like 
if I said it and if I did it, those are my, and if I feel it, those belong to me. And if you said it and if you did it and if you feel those belong to you, like I'm not responsible for what you said or did. And, and those of us who tend to people please and kind of acquiesce to other people's emotions and behaviors, we tend to get that very convoluted. And I'm like, oh, wait, you said this because I said this, so that's on me. No, what left my lips is on me. So if, if I spoke in a mature way and I was honest and I had good intentions and I was clear, then I, then I can walk away from that conversation feeling good. Right. Right. And the goal in these moments is like, really not, he said, she said, or they said, I said, whatever. It's truly like, can we find common ground and understanding regardless of who's right or wrong? Cause who cares who's right or wrong here? Let's seek understanding and find solution. Because you also point out another post in one of the episodes of the podcast, or maybe a few of them, about looking at your partner as the enemy in mm. situations like this and how that's a terrible jumping off point. Yeah, oh, t- yeah. I mean, and I am a pro at it. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I may have dabbled in the art myself, you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. We should start a club, you know? Think, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. My, mine comes from obviously like the two people that were supposed to create a vi- environment that was safe and secure and loving and supportive, create a hostile environment, bless their hearts. They did. Yeah. And so unfortunately I look at the people closest to me at first and mind you, there's really no timeline on this. Sometimes it takes me a few months. Sometimes it takes me a couple of years if you're new in my life, but I am suspicious. I don't trust. And I do look at you like you're my enemy until there's enough experience with you to change that default setting, right? It's like the positive now has to outweigh the negative then for me to then be like, oh, you're good. Like poor Phil. I mean, poor Phil. He's the most patient man in the world because he he get he has to experience that from time to time with me and i it doesn't matter how many times i explain it to him he's like okay just move through it just move through it already <laughs> <laughs> well we all yeah we all have our charming quirks right um yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trust issues. Yeah. <laughs> Those fun, that's a whole bag of fun right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trust issues can be very difficult, right? Because, I mean, talk about an understatement, but that, because uh, also those things, we, we can see them in youth, but then they can be compounded by the abusive relationships of our past. And, and I don't know what Phil's history is with that and how open he is with that. But, you know, when then you're with a great partner who has their own trauma history, then you're, trying to divine both of you about, Hey, wait, is this activating your thing? And is this, you is, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I mean, Phil's experiences romantically have been positive ones. Mine have only ever been negative ones. So there's this, like this clear distinction between like my shit <laughs> and <laughs> what is like real and supportive and healthy for yeah. him. And he's almost at times having to teach me, even though I can teach people when it's our own blind spots and we're in it, we kind of go dumb, deaf, and stupid. We're just kind of like, what? Like I'm allowed to talk to you this way? Cause that's not how that went in the past. Right. So, you know, um, but when it's two people who have experienced trauma or abuse, that is, that can be a challenging thing because one trigger can then perpetuate someone else's trigger. And now you both are back and forth triggering each other, which is why you can't really depend on each other to move through that stuff. You kind of need outside like friends and support systems or professionals to be able to reference about what is going to be healthy and supportive and then return to that person in a much clearer mindset to be able to like navigate a conversation. What do you think the best uh, course of action is for someone who has either been away from therapy for a long time or is entering therapy for the first time in terms of having their needs met and knowing that it's not just something that's friendly or seems like an easy thing to do, but the right combination? 
In as in as in uh, getting into easy? a therapy, yeah. Okay, so I mean, here's the thing: the 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 first kind of like focal point that they should look at in in re-entering therapy or going to therapy for the first time is setting a clear intention on what are you trying to gain from this in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, and I've, I've experienced it with clients talking about their partners sometimes in sessions, they'll be like, Oh, I encouraged him to go to therapy and he's looking for a therapist and he's going. And I'm like, cause like you have to want to go. You, right. you can't be forced to do work like this. <laughs> it's literally the first thing I wrote when I was writing my terms and conditions on my website. Mm -hmm. I was like, you have to be open and willing. You have like nobody, even if somebody is like, can my child come to you? I go, do they want help? Right. Do they want to talk to somebody? So, you know, if you're not going there willingly on your own accord, then you're not going to have a clear intention. You're there because of force or obligation. Mm -hmm. But if you are going on your own accord, you should be very clear with yourself on what do I want to get out of this and, and not look at it like I'm giving myself a month to get whatever I need to get out of it. Because I think other people do that. And I can't speak for every mental health professional, but I discourage putting a timeline on anybody's yeah healing or support system. And if somebody does, maybe they have their own reasoning for it. But I don't believe that, especially in the work I do, because sometimes what takes one person three weeks could take another person four months to really grasp. Sure. Uh, and what about for those entering for the first time, is there anything that they should look out for that as a, as a positive sign, let's say a green flag for mm. someone that they can work with on their issues? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I got to create a distinction here, and that's if they're looking for people online, right? If they found the professional online, mm -hmm. a good indicator of a green flag is, do you like their use of language and the way they interact with people on their page? Mm -hmm. And if they're not interacting with people on their page, for me, that would be a little bit of a red flag. Sure. Like, I want to see how you speak. And this is what I tell people who in any area of life are like unsure about making a right decision or a wrong decision about a person, pay attention to the way they speak to you and, and how it leaves you feeling like, is it invalidating? If you go to a therapist or you call up for a consult and they tell you, you shouldn't feel certain ways, or they tell you you're wrong, or they tell you something like that, that's not a good sign. But if you call and, and, listen, the first person answers the phone, like the receptionist, you get a good impression from that's a green flag. Go yeah. there because that's the, that's like the first kind of like face of the company, right. Or office setting. Mm -hmm. And so that's an indicator of that energy. And that's an indicator of that person's mentality and that person's behavioral patterns, because they chose somebody who was kind and respectful to answer their phones. And then hopefully that, you know, ripples out and your experience with the therapist is good. But I would, I pay attention to how people talk to me on the phone. Like I'm not going to a doctor's office if that receptionist is rude to me. Oh, I, I don't even want to go to a uh, non-psychiatric doctor if there's any kind of a hint of rudeness because it just spells yeah. doom. And I think that's one of the things that we're taught over and over is to ignore our instinct on these things. Yeah. And then, especially if you are a trauma survivor, there's a lot of that going on because you've ignored that with either gaslighters or bad situations. And I'm thinking again about the situation you described before, abusive men who were very wealthy, because on the surface or on paper, people think, oh, well, you guys are all happy and you're great because you're with someone very successful. Mm, should... Yeah, because money equals happiness all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, all the time, all the time. They say, <laughs> that's right, money buys happiness, right? Yeah, no. I mean, these were some of like the wealthiest people I had ever come into contact with in my life. And I was like, you are so sad. Like you are <laughs> so sad on the inside. Like what happened to you growing up that made you like this, you know? Mm -hmm. But no happiness. I yeah, mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because uh, did you find it tough at the time to escape from the situations because of uh, familial or societal, um, not if not pressure, then impressions that you had sort of 
uh, settled down or found the right person or whatever. Oh, I w- a thousand percent mm-hmm. thought that. I mm-hmm. was like, this is it. But I also, from a very young age, was like trying to find my person. Like I was, I mean, that's part of the reason why I like went to therapy. I was like depressed and stuff. But why was I depressed, boys? You oh, know? yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it was always relationship stuff that kind of like stuck with me my whole life. So yeah, when I ended up in those relationships, I a thousand percent was like, you're the person, you're the person, you're the person, you're the person. And, you know, and tolerated a lot, tolerated more than I would, I mean, remotely even consider tolerating these days. And nobody liked these people in my life, by the way. <laughs> it's funny also nobody. when you find that out later from some people who are like, you know, we never liked them. Yeah, no. <laughs> Luckily, my 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 brother was actually with one of them. He was like, uh, no, Amy, no. Like, wouldn't even shake the guy's hand when he was around. Like, adamant, <laughs> this is not a good person at all. Yeah. And, you know, and so one of the things that helped me having had a history of abusive and toxic relationships was when I met Phil, I told one person, mm-hmm. and that was my brother. And my brother was like, well, I happen to also grow up with Phil. He li- he like grew up two roads away from me. Oh, and like wow. the way we, yeah, we like matched on a dating app. So it was all very, you know, woo woo. Yeah. But, wait, let me, let me guess. Uh, did you have a lot of stories where the two of you were in close proximity many, many other times, not just growing up, but somehow you just didn't meet until. No, well, no, not really. But the, I, well, sort of, cause right. Like if I was at my parents' house, and he was at his parents' house. They are literally three minutes from each other. So the, I mean, it. Yeah. You can't make that up. So, right. so I said to my brother, you know, like I knew of him because he was he was older than me growing up. So I knew the name and I knew his brothers, but I didn't know him specifically. Mm. And I so I mentioned to my brother, and my brother was like good family. I remember them. He was like, great guy, good family, good morals. Good. And I was just like, couldn't trust myself enough at the time. And that was all I needed at, mm-hmm. for the go ahead. And, you know, it's clearly panned out very well for me, but yeah. that, that was kind of like, I, I needed somebody else, their judgment. Cause I didn't have a good gauge and didn't believe I had a good gauge still. And I imagine also, uh, like I was when I met my partner, Ada, reluctant to talk about it to many people. Also, we met online. Uh, she was to be mm. a guest on the podcast. And then we shelved the episode because we instantly started dating. It was at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, I'm reporting to you from her studio now in London. And we're expecting a child in uh, October. Oh, my God. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and then it, that's also fun because it's going to add the content on the show because we always got to be thinking <laughs> about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> always, always, always. You have to. Yeah. yeah. The poly queer parents and uh, <laughs> uh, who live on two co- uh, two countries. So, uh, um, but but then you know I was you know the, it's uh, sometimes I think of the thing of like you know if a dog has been abused, if it's slapped, let's say, anytime a hand goes toward it. It, the dog recoils. That's the quickest yeah. analogy I think of with all of this stuff. And you're very, um, I think it's a good sign too when you get hesitant about telling people about like, even saying something about her on the show took me a long time, right? Yeah. So um, I'm sure you found that. I mean, you did. You said you, uh, then, but then the joy is when you're <laughs> introducing people finally. And then later they're like, I'm so, this is amazing. Like, <laughs> I mean, like yeah, well, the, I, the, the funny part is, is that like, I kept him to myself completely other than my brother knowing, like I matched on an app with him and I was going on a date and that was like it. And from there, I was just like, you know what? I always told people and I'm going to keep this one to myself and just like, enjoy it. Mm. And it, I've never, I'm the worst secret keeper <laughs> in the world. Cause I'm just like, not good at lying. So I'm good. I'll, I'll withhold. But if you ask me directly, I'm going to suck at trying to hide that from somebody. Yeah. So, so I, I would visit my brother and sister-in-law after like driving from seeing Phil for like a couple nights. And I'd be like showing up to like hang out with my nephew 
and somehow hang out with them all day and not mention a word <laughs> that like where I was the last three days. I didn't yeah. even tell people that I was like driving out of state to see him sometimes. And like, all oh, I had a habit of like telling people, here's the address, here's where I'm going, just in case. This was like, no, keeping it to myself, protected it, safeguarded it. And then when I did tell people, they were like, when did this happen? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know, a couple months ago. <laughs> now, how long were you doing the, uh, um, the, let's call it a double life, just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> um well so so everything kind of happened quickly between him and i like i mean we got together we just like knew and it expedited the entire process we ended up moving in very quick everything i said i would never do i did yeah like all of my rules went out the window because it just <laughs> felt right and it was like natural and the right next steps so i was always like i won't live with a man until i have a ring on my finger i was very like traditional yeah no i mean we moved in like literally a week into this relationship mm. so he was living we were living together probably for several weeks i don't think i started to tell people until about a month in <laughs> and you know, he, we were all already shacked up and like living a life together. And yeah. then was like, he's coming to the family party. And they were like, <laughs> who? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. And that, I think that's a sign of healing, right? That you keep stuff to yourself, especially because I'm yeah, sure. You don't overshare. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm a bit of an overshare at times too. But then again, I don't mind so much because also, also what each of us does it sort of works for that as well, which is helpful. Exactly. It is helpful. <laughs> no, it is helpful. Like, I feel it's very healing in my profession to just be able to talk about some of these topics, even if I've moved through them, because I get to say them in a different way, or I have a new aha the minute I talk to a new client about something. I'm like, ooh, sometimes they're like, you are so weird because I'll say something and I'll go, Oh, that was good. Did you hear what I just said? That was really good. You know, because it's, it's kind of like you connect to what you're saying to them and you're not so entwined in your own inner judgment and mm. you're not overanalyzing stuff. So it's like the shit that comes out of me sometimes. I'm like, Oh, that was so good. I don't know where I got those words, but that was nice. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And there's something also about the convention, say, or the premise of doing the. Po the podcast or say uh, a session or whatever that it allows you because of the construct it's almost like you're improvising in the song over a song structure you know yeah. so and it gives you that freedom and it removes that uh, inner voice that's like oh wait are they going to take this that way or are you going to think that etc that makes sense no that makes sense and it's so fascinating to me though because it's just like i don't always listen back to myself and when i do i'm like well, I should do this more. I'm pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, listening back to yourself is an interesting thing because sometimes we can have a bad day and just be like, oh, it's all terrible. So that those are always signs. Just put it away. Go watch a movie. Yeah, return later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How long was it between uh, the la the prior relationship, the last one before Phil and Phil? Um, like the real relationship or like the, the dating escapades that I went on at the start of the pandemic when I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, my dog died and I guess I'm getting on a dating app now to stay busy. Well, look, we all, you know, you got to survive, <laughs> right? Yeah. And thrive in whatever way we could at that time. Yeah. And good for you for dating during that time. I was too terrified at the... I, well, I was traumatized. I mean, my, my dog, early podcast episodes address Dewey all the time. Like that was like my kid. Yeah. And you know, and that was a life way before Phil. So when he he originally heard about Dewey, he was like, that's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, weird relationship with your dog. And I'm like, and I'm getting him taxidermied now that he's dead. Do you love me more now? And he's like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah. So, I mean, like when you, when the, the animal that's like your child dies and then there's a pandemic, I was like, well, my vet told me I shouldn't be alone right now. Yeah. And so I had already just joined a dating app and started, started using it and was like, let's just keep this going. So, so one of the last people that I had been dating on that dating app, um, 
prior to, I mean, it had to have been about six or so months before Phil. Mm -hmm. It lasted probably like three to four months with that person. And so that was like the longest dating stint I had had in over six years. So like the last wow. real relationship was like six years prior to that. And mm -hmm. that was not fun because I got harassed for six years following the ending oh, wow. of that relationship. Yeah, yeah, that was tormenting to the nth degree. Like, <laughs> like do yeah. not recommend. At all. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it did sound like a, a, a fun way to go about things, but uh, turns out it's not. That's uh, yeah, that's horrible. But it, how long did you take away from dating totally once that officially ended, even though the harassment obviously continued, unfortunately? Um, so that went on six years. And then probably like two years after that ended is when I was like, okay, I'll maybe entertain a date. I was very anti online dating hmm. for a long time. And it's just like, if I'm meant to find my person, I'll bump into them on the street or in the grocery store or whatever. And then, you know, I, I got to a place in my own kind of journey, they say, or process where I was like, maybe I'm open. Maybe I'll just give it a shot. Maybe I'll see how that goes. And then literally like a month and a half into doing that dog dead and was like full force into yeah. this. Now let's just like find a focus and not think about the dead dog. And you know, and kind of expedited that process yeah. um, that some people spend years doing. I was like, mm, <laughs> we don't do that. We don't have time for that. We no. just go a yeah. good We're very efficient. Like you, like you said, it's time to exactly. make Exactly. Yeah, yeah make it's it the ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Ada and I met in person finally in February for my birthday, apparently that's when it happened because I had never ever thought I was going to have a child. Uh, she had tried, but it does. It what didn't seem like a possibility anymore. Okay. But turned out to be the right two people apparently for for this. So That's yeah, a lot of surprises. How it works. Yeah, very yeah. expedited, very efficient use of our time, apparently. Yeah. That's great. Wait. So now, not to like turn this interview. No. But now go I'm ahead. Genuinely curious. So yeah. so she's in London. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're in. I'm currently LA? in London. I'm uh, and I yeah. Well, so I'm, you're I'm in be London right now. Okay. Yes, I'm in London right now, and I'm going to be going back there in about two weeks into L.A., and then I'm going to be coming back, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, and then definitely back for October. And, yeah, so it's going to be back Is it forth. an October baby? Are we having a Scorpio? Yeah, I th yeah, I think so. Is that the, like the last week of October? You're a Scorpio as well? October 29th, yeah. Oh, my God, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Ada's yeah. birthday is, the, uh, is in October as well, so this is a good, really? it's a good month. Yeah, it is. It is a good month. <laughs> that's that's really exciting, though. Congratulations. Thank you. That's very amazing. Much. Thank um, you. And I I'm like genuinely now invested in this, like, you know, overseas back and forth child <laughs> in this world. How will you navigate this? This is amazing, though. Well, thank you. And also, uh, you know, for the Patreon folks, there'll be a special uh, audio journal, kind of like Stassi's thing. I, I saw that you okay. were friends with Stassi. I know her from, Katie used to be my upstairs neighbor. But anyway. Yeah. yeah. Phil was her manager. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Oh, amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're a manager having counseling background, very good thing. <laughs> That's what he says. Yeah, he says it's come. It comes in very handy in his career. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well, yeah. There'll be more um, tales to be told because actually, so this episode is going to come out after the twenty week scan, which is in a couple weeks. So this will come okay. out in like a month or something like that. If that's good with you. Totally good with me. Great. So I'm wait, gonna... was this the first announcement of the pregnancy? There's going to be um, one. There's a oh, sort of a special episode. Work. Okay. Because the other thing is we taped an episode and we didn't air it. So we're we're right. at some point going to do some kind of reaction thing to it because we haven't oh, watched it. Funny. I've just pulled frames from it because it's surreal that we have our first meeting on tape. So that's so cool, though. Thank you. And, and there's going to be a whole discussion of the whole thing, I think, but probably with the two of us uh, talking about it. No, I love I love that though, and I love that you guys can like get on and and be honest and vulnerable and like share your experience. I mean, I'm obviously a strong proponent of that, but yeah, I mean, I think it's incredible, and that's how people get you know a good visual representation of of what is available. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's why for me, I mean, I'm not even lying because I suck at lying. I'm genuinely excited about you sharing that because I think there are people in this world who would be like, that's not possible to do. How could I possibly do that? And you get to be the visual representation of that, which is but, amazing. That's lovely. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate oh. that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm excited and looking forward to that as well. And um, yeah. making that a through line on the show as well. Also talking about, uh, you said earlier, uh, you know, your brother entering into fatherhood and all that stuff. And again, this is something that I never even considered and I'm very into it, but I, you know, it was not in the plan, let's say. So that's an interesting aspect as well. Now I've become the the interviewer here, but (laughs) (laughs) I don't get to interview people. I just interview myself all day. But so as somebody who never thought about being a parent, how like now that it, because I have this and other, like I always wanted a really great, healthy relationship, but I never thought it was like truly possible. So then when I got it, I was like, Oh, am I prepared for this? Like I didn't really plan for this, you know, and I didn't put my ducks in a row, so to speak. So like what kind of came to mind when you found he's like save it for another episode no this is great (laughs) no this is this is fantastic uh i'm i really appreciate this line of questioning and i uh i very much in line with my line of thinking uh i was well so shocked when the news arrived because it happened the day after she flew home from her trip that she discovered yeah so i feel like the shock wouldn't have been so gargantuan had it been us in the same room and the funniest yeah, thing yeah. is that we were on the phone with each other not on facetime so it, and then after like we got like stressed and freaked out it was like wait wait let's do facetime let's see each other's yeah. face let's make this a little <laughs> bit easier for ourselves uh and then i did wig out a little bit because i just thought of all of the complications that could mm. uh, arise um just with various career things and um coming out of the pandemic you know and uh, the uh, living in different locations thing, I think wasn't even as big of an issue. It was more, we just met in person and we had the greatest time and this is a healthy relationship. And we've been, you know, talking to each other, uh, every day for the better part of two years and very hesitantly or rather cautiously, very cautiously with everything, even doing the things like we're like, well, both of us have bad histories with some people, but let's not talk about that except to know that we have right. had those so as to not get into that thing where you're trading stories like baseball cards yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah which is easy to do but then you're sort of like it's almost like you're in a fan club or something you're talking about a situation whether it's negative or positive you're both big fans of the beatles but you know that gets old you're not really getting to know each other after a while yeah no you're just bonding over the bad shit yeah yeah exactly which again is a definitely you know that's a temptation that hits anyone i'm sure that's uh, in that situation oh, sure i mean it happens all the time when i come on a podcast i'm like <laughs> you had child i had that you had that happen to you i had that happen you know and then the call ends and then you're like okay cool i like that person but like we don't interact every day you know what i mean yeah. so to do it with your partner that could create a challenge for sure yeah now we've obviously delved into certain things now that we've gotten to know each other and all that stuff. And because also, like you said, getting your ducks in a row. Well, one of those things is me getting back into therapy just because Mm. of a a number of reasons. Uh, I wanted to and then didn't. And then, you know, and then I was like, okay, there's some things I need to sort out just about my, say, impressions from family dynamic, uh, say that some stuff was a little stormy in the household, Um, you know, and then there was a lot of uh, the feeling of walking on eggshells, the feeling of, that and again i love my parents and they did the best that they could and they're wonderful and i'm looking forward to seeing them this summer but you know they also had their own trauma history and they had a lot of stuff to deal with and they weren't um they didn't have the um, luxury of having their corresponding parent in action Mm. which is interesting that they found each other because my dad is the eldest of 12 and the father passed early so then he was helping to support the family, you know, a lot of things. So you don't really have a lot of time to live your own life in, yeah. in, a, in an economically disadvantaged situation. Quick. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, um, and both of them have had their struggles. And my mother had uh, a similar thing with, with uh, her mother, 
Ooh, uh, so there was, um, you know, that thing where <laughs> you you understand. I'm like, how much do I share on the, about that part? No, uh, I get it. Listen, yeah. I'm like already like connecting thing. I'm like, oh yeah, my grandma was like the, you know, she had her mom died very when she was very young, and she had to become like the mother to like eight other siblings. Totally get it. No wonder yeah. my mother feels neglected or you know emotionally disconnected from people because her mom was probably just like trying to survive and didn't know how to extend that affection or that care. Yeah, exactly. And and you mentioned really get it. <laughs> and you had mentioned in an episode of your podcast about the withholding thing that your dad would do when you were looking yeah. for praise and and withholding is such a difficult thing and we all, all found ourselves in that d- dynamic to varying degrees with people and it, it's a weirdly addictive and totally um uh, What's the opposite of nourishing? Whatever that is, uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. My my dad, you know, I look at him now and I'm like, oh, you just needed a hug growing up and like someone to tell you it's okay to cry. But, mm-hmm. you know, he didn't get that. And so Mr. Hardass was like with his daughters, get over it, suck it up. What are you doing? Why are you crying? And like didn't extend the you look pretty today, Amy, or I'm proud of you, Amy. And then my mom would like, you know, chime in and be like, Jeff, tell her you love her. And my dad would be like, she knows I love her. And I was like, daddy doesn't love me. Daddy only loves me because mommy makes him say, and like, it was, you know, a cycle of fuckery in and of itself. So yeah, I mean, to watch my brother though, like this parenting thing to watch my brother and the way he's so gentle with his son is so refreshing to see because I know my sister-in-law says like when the minute she knew she was pregnant, my brother was very adamant about breaking the cycle of what we experienced as kids. And as you know, I mean, everybody has their own path and their way of doing things, but my brother hasn't gone to therapy and pretty certain hasn't done the bulk of maybe what I've done, but mm-hmm. he's had his stuff that he's worked through for sure. So to witness kind of him moving through it during the fatherhood phase is really enlightening and, and to see him change and grow and really extend something different is like, wow. Okay. Like, even if you're not ready with your ducks in a row, it's more than possible. If you've got the intention at the forefront to do something different. Well, th- yeah, though, that's uh, good to know, because also it, there's that thing of like, you can never be too prepared for the thing. And then there's the other thing about control too. And uh, to add to the, the thing I was talking about, the the other aspect of it is that I did not have a good time with other children when I was a child. So there was a lot of bullying. There was a lot of just misery with kids in, in school. So a friend of mine, Jen, asked me to run down all the lists of why I either didn't want to have kids or would be scared to have kids or whatever it was right around the time that we found out that we were having a, a child. And I, so I gave her the list of things and she said, well, you know, what's interesting about that. None of them have to do with kids. They, they're to do with, you know, the stuff that you dealt with in school, uh, the, uh, family dynamic. And again, my, my folks are great, but there was just some stuff that compounded with or combined with the school stuff and all of that it was not great, yeah. you know, and also being very sensitive to uh, tone of voice and things like that. So, um, and again, they tried their, their best and all of that. I, I don't want to, I'll cut that second repeat out. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) I think it's important, Craig, to keep saying it, though, because a lot of people (laughs) make them their enemy. And it's like, you know, not everybody gets to the point where they can maybe forgive someone, but you can get to a point with most people where you're like, I can acknowledge that they were struggling, too. That may mean that I keep my distance, depending on the situation. But if you're still charged up about it, you're still not healed of it, you know? That's a really good point. And, uh, you know, and with them, like my dad now, every time I talk to him on the phone, he tells me that he loves me and he's proud of me. And it it's also just not language that maybe he knew how to do. He would joke about stuff maybe a little bit more, you know, and some stuff. It just Same with my dad. Yeah, the yeah. sarcasm. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. And I mean, I'm a big proponent of sarcasm, but I feel uh, uh, it's uh, best in certain situations and not in others. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's this fine blurry line, you know, with sarcastic people of like, okay, like keep it over here. And when we're going to be serious now, could you like bring a level of like, 
you know, compassion and empathy and seriousness into the conversation and maybe not lead with your own trauma masking everything as a joke, because that's really what's going on. Like if you can kind of set the boundary and separate the two, that's comedic. But if, but if it starts to, you know, like blend well, together, yeah. hmm, trauma. trauma. <laughs> yeah. When you're discussing emotions or if you're dealing with someone else's uh, vulnerability, with sarcasm, maybe not yeah. so good. Yeah. No. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I um, I'm very much looking forward to it. I don't know if I I uh, answered your question fully. No, you did. We we did what we've done for the last I don't know hour or so, which is like we we loop back to the point. <laughs> yes. At some point, which is yeah. good. It's a very conversational way of like you know conveying a really important message, which is not boring to the listener, which I think is important. I think it's important too. And also I really appreciate uh, being able to get into the space where I'm like sort of drifting and going over the topic because I haven't really talked about that, those aspects on, on the show yet. So thank you. Oh, cool. You're welcome. I'm honored that I could, you know, <laughs> bring forth this part of the conversation. Oh, well, that, I think, go, I, I think, gonna say you know, lovely, yeah. oh, well, I, I suck at receiving compliments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too, I'm way too reflexive myself. I, it's almost yeah. like I have to, but any, you were going to say? <laughs> I was what I was going to say was like being able what your friend had you do being able to pull apart like whatever that narrative is in your head that feels like fear like pluck it apart what it sounds like is you're kind of just like peeling back layers of an onion to find and realize that like wait I don't actually dislike children or I'm not actually scared of kids like I was similar to you hated kids uh-huh Ironically, I nannied seven boys, but I hated children for like a good portion of my life. And then I got this nanny job out of like desperation because I was getting spiritual help from, from, from the woman who I was working for and couldn't afford her help. So it's mm -hmm. just like, oh, sure, I'll clean, I'll cook, I'll watch your kids. I don't think I'm capable, but here we are. <laughs> and what I realized in that process was it it presented me an opportunity to give to these children what I never got as a kid. And, you know, and then that kind of like later transpired with my dog as well, like to experience even with an animal unconditional love, which I didn't really have an example of just to get that and know like, Oh, you're not going anywhere when I sucked today. That's cool. Cause like, mom and dad went somewhere when I sucked, you know, or they said some shit, but to be in a parenting role with children that weren't mine mm -hmm. allowed me to then stand there and be like, okay, you know what? Like, I'm not going to scream and yell at you like your mom or dad is because I got screamed and yelled at as a kid. So how did I want to be treated as a little girl? I wanted to just have somebody sit down and like, just like, keep it real with me. Like shoot the shit. Like, Hey, yeah. listen, you didn't do your homework again. Why don't you tell me how you're feeling and what's going on here? Like, this class sucks. Is it boring? Is your teacher like mean? Like, talk to me. And these kids develop such a trust mm -hmm. and a safety that I realized the impact that had on them, but on me as well. And that allowed me to kind of heal a part of myself to, to then go on and be like, I love kids. Yeah. <laughs> Give yeah. me all the children now. I'm so good at this. But <laughs> truly, I think what I'm trying to say is it's our resistance to that part of ourself mm -hmm. that make that creates that level of like an aversion or resistance to something new and exciting like that. Yeah. And and uh, it's been really good to think about all that stuff because it's uh, allowed me to think about some other things or like you said, peeling back the layers of the onion and uh, it's something yeah. i'm very much looking forward to even though you know some, every once in a while you're like what <laughs> it's because it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. it, it can sometimes we'll, we'll both be like it's crazy right isn't this crazy <laughs> but that's another thing i really appreciate about ada is that we talk about things very openly about feelings or whatever it is so important it's so important and it and it's probably you know like like you said about your dad right if he was more of a joking kind of guy it's probably really refreshing to have a partner yourself where maybe watching mom and dad, it was a very different experience to watch their dynamic, but now you get to cultivate one that's like so vulnerable and honest and open mm -hmm. that creates such a deep intimacy between two people. 
It really does. Yeah. And the intentionality of it as well, because we can all slip back into those modes where we're operating under the pretext that something has to be this way. Like you mentioned before, like depriving yourself of the things that make you happy or having to schedule in the relaxation and fun. I think yeah. a, lot of, a lot of times we look at situations in life uh, where it's like, oh, well, I'll have to not enjoy myself now because that's the adult way of doing things which I think yeah. is completely wrong, but that gets drilled into us, I think, societally, not from family necessarily, but you hear a lot of things, oh, you know, well, you know what you're going to have to do now, that sort of thing. I uh, No, but that's a that's a really good point to make and, and kind of relevant to what I'm dealing with now, like creating this course, because I'm yeah. like, oh, this sucks. Like, there's like a way to do it and I have to do it that way. And I've never done anything in my career the way everybody else does it. Like people were like for a long time, Amy, you can make much more money not seeing clients one-on-one. -on -one. You're not a therapist. You can make so much more money as a life coach. And I was like, I actually like this. And I genuinely am enjoying this process right now of like helping people. And mm -hmm. I'm good one-on-one. -on -one. Like I'm good. So so I followed my instinct there. And then, you know, any kind of pivot in my, in my career, I was like, I always, and I'm working through something around this right now. So that was very, very potent for me because it's oh, like great. a constant reminder in my life of like, return back to yourself mm -hmm. and, and do it the way that you want it to be done. You know, if you want parenting to be fun, make parenting fun. If you want creating a course to look, completely different than any other thing out there and it just makes sense to you great then you're aligned and it will make sense to the right people kind of like my podcast everyone's like you need guests i was like people are nice and i talk to them all day but this was an outlet for me that i really created for myself and mm -hmm. it just inadvertently ends up being helpful to so many other people right I think and oh, go ahead no, that I, I mean, I'll just keep adding to my sentences. Yeah. <laughs> we like a, a, a additive. Uh, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more about that because it really, you do have to listen to your instinct. And there's so many people that will tell you what you need to do, what you need to have. Uh, people say, oh, uh, oh, you need to have segments on your show. You need to do this. You don't have to do anything other than what you want to do. And that includes the guests that you want to have or the style of conversation. Yeah, honestly, I, I think it's a big takeaway in life and, and in and what really any topic you talk about. Yeah. If you just stay true to you and what makes sense for you and what feels alive and refreshing and invigorating for you, it will make sense to other people like yeah. the right people will get you and hear you and understand you and see you. But we're so we're so stuck on doing it the other way around. Like I need to explain myself to you or I need, I need to make sure I kind of like carve it out in a way that it like immediately make, no, it's got to make sense inside to make sense out. And that goes truly with trauma and everything else we've talked about today. If it like makes sense inside, then eventually you'll be able to adjust things outside and communicate better outside and work better with the people in your life. I think that's a wonderful note to close on. I mean, I, I would talk for ages with you and I'd like to do another one with you sometime. I would love to. Absolutely. Wonderful. It's been really a, a, such a delight uh, and an honor to meet and chat with you, Amy. Same. And congratulations. I'm so happy for you and Ada. And I mean, I can't wait to chat again. Thank you so much. And same here.